Good morning, everyone. We are glad you can join us for Shopify's first quarter of 2022 conference call. We are joined this morning by Toby Lutka, Shopify's CEO, Harley Finkelstein, Shopify's president, and Amy Shapiro, our CFO. After their prepared remarks, we will open it up for your questions. We will make forward-looking statements on our call today that are based on assumptions and therefore subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from those projected. We undertake no obligation to update these statements except as required by law. You can read about these assumptions, risks, and uncertainties in our press release this morning, as well as in our filings with U.S. and Canadian regulators. Note that the adjusted financial measures we speak to today are non-GAAP measures, which are not a substitute for GAAP financial measures. Reconciliations between the two can be found in our earnings press release. And finally, we report in U.S. dollars, so all amounts discussed today are in U.S. dollars unless otherwise indicated. With that, I turn the call over to Harley. Good morning, everyone. For the past two years, we have been on an extraordinary journey with merchants, helping them sell on any and every channel as commerce shifted numerous times during the pandemic. Throughout the last two years, we showed up for our merchants when they needed us most. And now, the trust we built with them throughout the pandemic with our platform is being rewarded with more of their business. This momentum encourages us to continue to invest for the long term. The more hard problems we solve for merchants, the more energy we add to our flywheel, and the better off commerce is for everyone for years to come. As we start to put the pandemic behind us, there is yet another shift happening in commerce. And the good news is Shopify is again on the right side of that change. Beginning in February, many people, myself included, celebrated the easing of Omicron and rolling back of mandates with travel, dining out, entertainment, and in-person shopping. While this new mobility moderated the explosive growth in online activity that we've seen over the last couple of years, it drove home the importance of commerce everywhere, online, in-app, and in real life. Brick-and-mortar merchants learned this lesson two years ago when they were forced to close their doors almost overnight. Tens of thousands of physical retailers pivoted quickly and moved online using Shopify. Shopify played a mission-critical role for these businesses over the pandemic when they needed it most, and we directed all of our energy to making sure businesses could stay open when their physical presence had to immediately shut down. Everyone from mom and pops to merchants with large operations and considerable existing sales came fully online with Shopify, which at the time was the only sales channel that mattered. Now that physical retail is reopening and retail in general is rebalancing, this bigger position we've earned and the trust that we've earned with our merchants represents a huge opportunity for us. The hundreds of thousands of businesses that shifted their business to Shopify during the pandemic and stayed with us since can now take advantage of our powerful retail point of sale offering for a unified view of their sales online and offline. Shopify has been developing the world's best point of sale retail software for years, and it's now at the point where all merchants who came to Shopify during the pandemic can leverage it. No need to go back to their old dilapidated POS systems. As we mentioned last quarter, we are growing our sales team and marketing support to help ensure that any merchant doing in-person selling on Shopify knows how much stronger the Shopify point of sale value proposition is relative to standalone offerings. And this is because we've done a great job building our point of sale channel. For example, luxury label Philip Lynn adopted our point of sale for multiple retail locations this past quarter, as did the clothing retailer Fear of God. As Point of Sale Pro added more merchants, locations, and geographies in Q1, we grew offline GMV by nearly 80% year over year as we continue to gain share. Even with the current resurgence in offline retail, we still believe that e-commerce will continue to grow and take share of overall retail over the long term, and we are well positioned here with our online commerce GMV posting a 51% compound annual growth rate since the start of the pandemic in Q1 2020, faster than overall e-commerce over the same period. And we took share this past quarter as well. Our overall GMV, including offline, grew even faster at a 57% compound annual growth rate since Q1 2020, demonstrating that the opportunity for Shopify is beyond just online. It's to be the commerce platform of choice in any environment and on any surface. The result of these past two years 
is that our trust battery with merchants is fully charged. To prove it, merchants are taking more of our offerings to compete in the fast-moving digital commerce landscape. A central value prop of our business model is that the platform gets more robust and more relevant to a merchant over time. Here we showcase three merchants that illustrate a common theme. Newer and smaller merchants get great value from a few features. As they become more established, they add more and with increased volume, even more. Figs, a publicly traded company built entirely on Shopify, started on our $79 plan. They grew into features which helped them scale and are still only just getting started. Merchants rely on Shopify for these needs, not just because they trust us, but also because it's easier, more reliable, and importantly, saves them money. And in the inflationary environment we're in now, this is especially important. By passing the economies of scale we capture down to our merchants, Shopify saves merchants money compared to what they would pay to secure each of those solutions separately, allowing them to free up capital to grow their businesses. We are training more of our sales and support teams to be able to highlight to merchants ways they can benefit from making fuller use of our platform. As a result, we believe there's an opportunity to deliver more services to merchants while saving them money. Our merchant solutions revenue expanded by 29%, driven by increased penetration of Shopify payments and capital, as well as growth in revenue from our partners helping to extend the value of our platform. Because we are on the same side of the table as our merchants, they can thrive on the platform, and they do. Shopify Plus once again saw a large percentage of its merchant additions this past quarter come from upgrades, such as luxury menswear brand Tom Sweeney, coffee house Dogwood Coffee, and fragrance company Ellis Brooklyn, created by New York Times beauty columnist B. Shapiro. These last several years have proved that serving both startups and large companies is not mutually exclusive especially when you have an entire ecosystem of support from both ends of the market, and we continue to invest in both. For example, with our new Lincoln Bio tool, LinkPop, our unmatched capabilities for creators got even better. This is only one example of how commerce can happen anywhere. What we've seen over the past two years throughout the pandemic has been a shift of transactions to digital venues beyond the online store, where buyers are discovering goods. For years, we've invested in APIs to more easily connect our merchants with buyers across services and directly transact on partner platforms, starting with Meta and Google. Orders completed on key partner services more than quadrupled year over year. While it's still a small percentage of the $43 billion of GMV we did in the quarter, it indicates growing momentum on this multi-year trend towards commerce everywhere. This should not be surprising. With the shifting landscape of the digital ads industry, merchants are becoming increasingly focused on finding new ways to reach buyers, and they're finding success with commerce completed directly in the app or on the search surface itself. For larger enterprises, Deloitte and Accenture are now officially partnering with Shopify on systems integrations to help some of their largest clients achieve and maintain marketing agility. We've already collaborated with the team at Deloitte Digital for Audi, World Vision, and Inkbox. And as Fortune 500 companies move fast to keep their brands top of mind, we look forward to working with systems integrators to bring more of the world's best loved brands onto Shopify Plus. The energy at Shopify Plus right now is terrific. As the team finished Q1 with their best month ever, closing 20% more deals in March than ever before. The variety of merchants and ways they're using Shopify Plus continue to grow with new launches in the quarter, spanning well-known brands in food, footwear, art supplies, cosmetics, athletic gear, tech companies, and video games, including the legendary Miami Beach restaurant, Joe's Stone Crab, Havaianas, Mexico, Crayola, Fiera Cosmetics, Bridgestone Cycle, TRX Training, Figma, and Call of Duty. The internet's favorite influencer, Mr. Beast, launched his own chocolate brand on Shopify Plus this past quarter. And the NBA followed the lead of the Chicago Bulls, who launched the sale of NFTs last summer with their own all-star NFT store on Shopify in the quarter. Our track record and our momentum with merchants tell us we are on the right track, investing for the long term to solve more hard problems for them, and in doing so, energizing our flywheel. I'd like to double-click on what we mean when we talk about our flywheel, as this approach differs from the zero-sum approach of a lot of other companies. Direct monetization from the customer in the short term is good. 
However, building something that may be less immediate and direct, but will generate more value for the customer and for Shopify over the long run is much, much better. We have many examples of how we've applied the flywheel over the years, from APIs to Liquid to our App Store and the long-term relationship we have with our community of developers, an ecosystem built over a decade. None of these were very material in the short run, but over time, they strengthened every aspect of our platform. Keeping our momentum, our approach to investing for the long term is consistent with our continued investment in the Shopify Fulfillment Network. Supply chain management and fulfillment are some of the biggest challenges merchants face running their businesses. Millions of small merchants struggle to scale even once they've built a product they know buyers want. To actually get an order to a buyer, they have to fumble through a maze of freight providers, 3PLs, and middle and last mile carriers. We know merchants trust Shopify to offer simple, reliable, cost-effective solutions to their biggest problems. That's why we're creating the world's most merchant-obsessed end-to-end software and logistics platform, fully integrated into the Shopify ecosystem. We are simplifying logistics across every stage of a merchant supply chain, from inventory inbounding, to inventory distribution across all merchant channels to fast and affordable D2C order fulfillment and returns. Making this end-to-end -end supply chain easier to navigate for merchants reduces the barriers to becoming a successful entrepreneur, increases their odds of success, and offers a durable source of energy to the flywheel and differentiates us even more. So today we're announcing the acquisition of Deliver, our largest acquisition yet to strengthen Shopify's fulfillment network and accelerate our path to an end-to-end -end merchant supply chain solution. Fulfilling more than a million orders per month, Deliver's Asset Light technology-driven service is trusted by thousands of merchants across the US to connect all stages of a merchant supply chain and manages distribution and fulfillment to all merchant channels. For the post-order phase of the merchant supply chain, SFN has made considerable progress towards our core offering which includes inventory balancing, delivery promises, and simple returns functionality. Our proprietary warehouse management system we've been developing is now running in our key warehouse locations and will handle all SFN order volume by the end of Q2 2022. Combining Shopify Fulfillment Network with Deliver software, talent, data, and scale provides merchants simplified inventory management and logistics services demand-driven inventory placement that eases minimum inventory requirements and offers highly reliable, fast, and affordable delivery. We are thrilled to soon welcome Deliver's experienced team of software engineers, operations experts, and merchant champions to Shopify. While adding Deliver this year will impact profitability in 2022, it's well worth it because it accelerates our ambitions around SFN. Despite Q1 not being the easiest start to the year on the macro front, we showed an adjusted operating profit of $32 million on 22% revenue growth. This is on top of 110% growth last year during lockdowns and boosted by stimulus. This past quarter's growth was partly driven by our merchant solutions revenue reaching a record high as a percentage of GMV. That means that our merchants are getting more value from our platform than ever before. It is in times like these that great companies prove themselves through a combination of strategic decisions executed in time right and maintaining strong operating discipline. Our merchants need to be ready for whatever the future brings because they know omni-channel is more than just online versus offline. It's commerce on social platforms, in apps, in videos, and it's wherever communities and creators are connecting. The surge in digital commerce push transactions far beyond the online store, and they're increasingly happening in app, in social, in search, and even email. This larger mix of channels is what makes Shopify so valuable in any environment and across every buying surface. Building all the right tools for commerce to happen on every surface where we believe the future of commerce lives is one of our superpowers and why merchants, large and small, are building their own futures on Shopify. Thanks, Harley, and good morning, everyone. The trends Harley just talked about, how much more important Omnichannel is right now, merchants making greater use of Shopify, and the importance of investing now to stay ahead of the curve for merchants were clear in our financial results in Q1. 
But before we dig into that, I want to first speak to what we're seeing on the macro front and how it relates to what we've seen over the past two years, because that's impacted our results in Q1. While our performance in the quarter was consistent with the guidance we provided you in February, a couple of macro factors played a larger role than expected. Before I review these factors, we reminded you in February that last year's first quarter GMV growth was 114% year over year, as online consumer spending on goods soared, fueled by government stimulus and lockdowns. This surge was not unique to Shopify. Fast forward 12 months, our GMV growth for this year's first quarter was 16% year over year. The timing of Omicron easing was also a factor, with mobility resuming with vigor earlier in Q1 of this year versus Q1 of last year, causing a shift in consumer spend to offline retail and travel starting in early February this year in strong contrast to a year ago where that shift occurred in late March and into April. Another factor that impacted year-over-year GMV growth more than expected, although to a lesser extent than mobility, was inflation at a record level, pushing more consumer spend both online and offline toward discount retailers in Q1 of this year as consumers' wallets were stretched from higher prices, including a surge in gas prices due to the war in Ukraine. Even with these macro factors impacting year-on-year growth in the quarter, our online and offline GMV in Q1 each continued to outpace their respective markets in the U.S. In the case of offline, our retail GMV grew approximately six times the market, underscoring our omnichannel advantage relative to online-only providers and enabling merchants to be prepared for anything. And in the context of the past two years, overall GMV growth of 57% compounded annually highlights just how far Omnichannel has enabled independent brands to reach. Our revenue for the first quarter grew to $1.2 billion, which is 22% higher than the same period last year, and represents a two-year compound annual growth rate of 60%. In addition to the macro factors that I noted earlier that affected our year-over-year comparison, revenue for subscription solutions was also impacted by the app and theme revenue models for partners, as well as by the change in recognition of themes revenue from gross to net, which were not yet in place in Q1 of 2021. This change in terms and treatment for apps and themes accounted for about two points and seven points of headwind to our overall revenue and subscription solutions revenue growth in the quarter, respectively. Subscription solutions revenue of $344.8 million grew 8% year over year, reflecting the app and theme revenue chains I just talked about, as well as lower merchant ads in the quarter compared to Q1 a year ago. While increased mobility, along with a robust labor market, tempered our merchant ads in the quarter, monthly recurring revenue was up 17% year over year, benefiting from Shopify Plus and the addition of thousands more POS Pro retail locations. Merchant Solutions revenue grew to $858.9 million in Q1, up 29% compared to the same period in 2021. This was nearly twice the growth of GMV due to the increased adoption of Shopify payments, Shopify capital, and even Shopify markets, which has gotten off to a strong start, as well as growing revenue from partners. $22 $22 billion of GMV was processed on Shopify payments in Q1, an increase of 27% over last year's first quarter. Payments penetration of GMV was 51% versus 46% in Q1 2021. Over the past four quarters, we've seen gross payments volume benefit from strong performance by merchants on Shopify payments, an increasing percentage of which is Shopify plus GMV, new merchant adoption both in North America and internationally, Penetration gains in shop pay, which has facilitated $50 billion in GMV since inception, and expanded availability of our POS Pro hardware with integrated payments now being used by merchants in 11 countries. Adjusted gross profit was $646.1 million, compared with $565.1 million in the first quarter of 2021, reflecting a greater mix of our lower margin merchant solutions revenue versus the prior year, Lower margins in Shopify payments due to mix, increased investments in our cloud infrastructure, and the impact of the change in terms for our app and theme partners versus the prior year. Adjusted operating income was $31.9 million in the first quarter, compared to $210.8 million a year ago, as we bolstered our R&D data and sales teams and stepped up performance marketing in both North America and internationally. 
Adjusted net income for the quarter was $25.1 million, or 20 cents per diluted share, compared with adjusted net income of $254.1 million, or $2.01 per diluted share, in the first quarter of 2021. Finally, our cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities balance on March 31st was $7.25 billion. This healthy cash balance is testament to the strength of our approach to capital allocation and operating discipline. Since day one, we have funded our growth wisely. Over the past seven years, we've raised $7.7 billion of funds via equity offerings in our convertible note, deployed $1.7 billion for investments in M&A as of March 31, 2022, and have conserved a strategic amount on our balance sheet for optionality. Outside of our acquisition of 6RS, all of our growth thus far has been organic, funded by redeploying gross profits back into the business to energize the flywheel. As I said in February, Shopify is focused on strategically allocating capital to four key investment themes in 2022, one of which is simplifying fulfillment for merchants. Shopify Fulfillment Network is making considerable progress against its roadmap. We've had great success migrating SFN merchants to the updated version of our new simplified offering. Not only does it make fulfillment easier, SFN is designed to intelligently rebalance merchants' inventory to maximize their fast fulfillment reach with the lowest committed inventory. As Harley outlined, the acquisition of Deliver helped Shopify Fulfillment Network accelerate its roadmap by assembling an end-to-end logistics platform that manages inventory from port to porch and across all sales channels for merchants of all sizes on and off Shopify. Soon, merchants will have access to Shop Promise, a new benefit in early access that displays expected delivery dates on merchants' online stores and other channels, and consumers will see a new badge on products they browse. This delivery promise extends beyond the online store across surfaces like Google, Facebook, Instagram, and the Shop app, helping merchants improve trust and increase sales with billions of potential customers by meeting them where they like to shop and will leverage SFNs and Deliver's fast fulfillment capabilities to power two-day and next-day delivery promises. We view simplified, fast, and affordable fulfillment across all sales channels as incremental to the Shopify flywheel, with the aim of helping millions of future merchants start and scale their businesses. So it is with much excitement that we announce the acquisition of Deliver. Under the terms of the agreement, Shopify will acquire all of Deliver's outstanding securities in a transaction valued at approximately $2.1 billion, consisting of approximately 80% in cash and 20% in Shopify Class A shares. Most of the stock-based portion of the transaction consideration will be received by Deliver's key management, will vest subject to certain conditions, and will be treated as stock-based compensation. We expect the transaction to close following regulatory review. Our financial outlook for the rest of 2022, which includes the impact of Deliver, is as follows. Our outlook for the full year is guided by the same assumptions we gave you in February. We're operating in a more measured macro environment relative to 2021, moderated by inflation. E-commerce will continue to penetrate commerce overall. And the prospects for entrepreneurship and digital commerce are greater now than at any point in our history after two transformational years for the industry and for Shopify. What these trends mean for expectations for our own results is as follows, that year-over-year growth will be lower in the first half of 2022 and highest in Q4, given the absence of stimulus payments and expected higher inflation relative to the first half of 2021 that the number of merchants joining the platform in 2022 will be comparable to 2021, and that merchant solutions revenue growth will be more than double that of subscription solutions. Because of this larger mix of merchant solutions contributing to overall revenue, we expect gross profit dollar growth will trail revenue growth, which we still expect to be rapid and faster for the full year than our revenue growth in the first half. Our intention to reinvest all of our gross profit dollars back into the business this year remains intact, since the pace of change independent brands need to get ahead of is not slowing down. Factoring in the effects of an inflationary environment on consumer spending, we expect our adjusted operating results to reflect the reinvestments in our four key themes outlined in February, as well as the impact of Deliver, which we expect to be dilutive to operating margin this year. As we help our merchants build buyer relationships, go global, 
grow from first sale to full scale, and simplify fulfillment, we're arming them for long-term success. Finally, the estimates of stock-based compensation and related payroll taxes, CapEx, and amortization of acquired intangibles, incorporating the impact of Deliver, are now $800 million, $200 million, and $62 million, respectively. Before turning it over to Katie to start the Q&A, I want to underscore the importance of long-term thinking that underlies our capital allocation decisions is how great companies are built. In the past, we have reinvested knowing we were laying the foundation for what we expected to be a much bigger company in the future. While we're much bigger today because we reinvested, the building that lies ahead of us is considerable, and that is a good place to be. Putting technology to work to help independent brands with everything from discovery to delivery guides us as we continue to build for the future of entrepreneurship. Thanks, Amy. We'll now open the call for questions. We've all had the last couple of years to get accustomed to the raise hand feature in Zoom, so you should have no problem using that. We'll take questions in the order they come in, and depending on how you're joining, you may need to press star six to unmute in order to ask your questions. Uh, while we made our best effort to boil down our prepared remarks to only the most relevant, and we armed you with much of the content on the events page of our investor relations landing page ahead of time, we still have a limited time for questions. So please ask just one very good question so we can get to as many as possible. And our first question this morning comes from Trevor Young at Barclays. Trevor, you can go ahead with your question. Great, thank you. Um, just parsing out the GMV commentary into the key buckets, POS up nearly 80%, social, I think, quadrupling. If we assume social is like low single-digit share, POS maybe mid-teens, that would imply the remaining 80 or 85% of e actually saw a very low single-digit growth year on year, you know, call it a few percentage points. Is that the right way to think about it? So we, we gave you a little bit of um, information in the prepared remarks on e-commerce. We outpaced the overall uh, U.S. market, and the U.S. market grew, uh, according to U.S. commerce data, approximately 10%. Um, so that should have given you some some view into the online performance. Thank Thanks, Trevor. Our next question comes from Daniel Chan at TD Securities. Daniel, you can go ahead with your question. Oh, hi, thanks. Uh, Deliver counts some of your competitors as customers. What are your plans on maintaining a relationship with them considering Deliver, Deliver likely benefits from the data, but its shipping capabilities would be a differentiator for you? Hey, I'll take that question. Uh, look, the, the, the great part about Deliver is that it accelerates what we've been planning to do with, um, uh, you know, this end to end logistics network. It gets there faster. And the fact that they have a great experience, they have great software, great talent and scale means that, uh, we can give more of our merchants more control, more, more full visibility. And of course they can own the, the relationship with the end consumer. So the idea here is we, we want to get our merchants high reliability, fast, affordable delivery. And we think we can do that much faster with Deliver. Now, that being said, in terms of their existing businesses, obviously we're going to adopt those businesses in, um, but we really are excited by the fact that Deliver is asset light, tech-driven, trusted by thousands of merchants. Some of those merchants are not on Shopify. Some of them may come to Shopify eventually, but the idea is really about product acceleration here. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Our next question is from Tom Forte at DA Davidson. Tom, go ahead. Great, thanks. So I wanted to ask you a question that other companies such as Netflix have discussed this quarter. Uh, given the weakness in your shares, how should investors think about your ability to attract and retain tech talent in a tight labor market? Thank you. Yeah, um, um, it was Toby, I'll take that. Um, well, I mean, we have, we have amazing people coming. I think people are, um, I mean, this is a really good time to uh, come to uh, Shopify and, and others. Um, we tend to not, um, obviously, it, obviously it comes up. Um, the, the, the share price, obviously people making economic decisions um, uh, in these kind of things, but maybe not quite as much as, as, as people think. Like it's, it's not really um, um, 
Homo economicus, who is, uh, you know, in, like engaged in the job market quite as much as uh, one might think. Um, what we find is people who are really, really interested in um, uh, finding companies that are uh, mission aligned with what they're doing, um, uh, what they want to see, the change they want to see in the world. Um, people are extremely excited. Again, like Harley uh, speaks so eloquently about the role that uh, Shopify's played during the pandemic. Um, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people have had uh, personal um, experience helping um, local businesses, many family businesses, uh, setting up Shopify stores uh, during this time and um, have been uh, sort of like uh, in the orbital pull of coming to work for Shopify to help more people in the same way, but from the inside instead of from the outside. So, you know, those are factors which are much more significant. Um, we've all seen the articles about, uh, you know, the great resignation. And, and like, I think this has been largely misreported. There has been a big shuffle um, uh, in, in, in the industry as people making different life choices um, or just maybe, uh, you know, look to find something new. Um, um, but we are not really see, seeing this. So in, in, in fact, um, I think like the company's bringing in incredibly high talented people. Uh, it, it's, it's, I, I'm almost humbled by the, like the, the incredible people I get to work with um, and the people who are coming in now um, coming from all over and now that we can hire everywhere in the world that's even more of a factor uh, um, uh, you know just some of the most talented people I've ever uh, met and encountered so I think this is all going really well um, and um, like retention I it's been again there is more shuffling in general um, and um, you know like I think um locality is like people can now work for companies everywhere in, in, in the world. And so people are trying out what that, uh, what, what that's like. <laughs> Funnily enough, we've actually seen a very large group of people coming back um, um, recently. Like that's, I think actually my colleagues are talking about this too, that this is actually almost a more notable trend um, right now um, than uh, people uh, like, turning over quicker is, 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 is the boomerang effect of people coming back to the companies that they started out the pandemic at. So honestly, this is a new, very dynamic labor market that has just puts people in the driving seat to choose the companies to uh, work for. I think every company needs to make sure that they are, um, you know, the kind of company that has the kind of challenges and the kind of talent density and the mission alignment to attract the best people um, or the people who are most appropriate for their particular missions. And I think Shopify does this extremely well. So um, I, we, we see this all um, working out. The stock price is something that um, factors into this. That is one input of many. And it's um, a, like most people tend to understand that the stock price is a sort of snapshot in time, um, uh, you know, variable where, um, uh, people are making more long-term choices now, I think, um, now that we're a bit further away from pandemic. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Tom. Our next question comes from Colin Sebastian at Baird. Great. Uh, thanks. Um, question on the fulfillment initiative and the vision for the end-to-end -end platform sounds quite compelling. Uh, just hoping to dig a little bit more into how the build out will work in particular, given Shopify's engineering orientation, um, perhaps some additional context around the need to buy versus build on the software side. And then on a physical footprint, maybe help us with additional context around the scale of this operation in the, in your vision and, and the potential investment required there to realize um, that long-term vision. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Look, I, I said this in the prepared remarks, but I'll repeat it again. Right now, merchants have to fumble through this maze of freight providers, 3PLs, middle last mile carriers, just to name a few. And so what SFN handles is sort of that post-order phase of the merchant supply chain. So that includes new things, even like inventory balancing and delivery promise, which we've brought up, and even simple returns. We also now have our proprietary warehouse management system now deployed across all warehouse locations. When you now add deliver to it, which is already fulfilling, you know, a million orders a month, this, this asset light, asset light software product, um, and they already have, you know, they already manage distribution fulfillment for many across all merchant channels. It pairs perfectly together. And what we end up with in the end is this merchant obsessed end to end software and logistics platform. What we like about Deliver and why Deliver is such a perfect fit for Shopify is that it's software first. And the fact that is it's asset light, it's tech driven means that we can manage our capex and also, uh, fit nicely into our existing product. 
I said this just a couple comments ago, but this really does allow us to accelerate the product roadmap on delivering this end to end, uh, you know, logistics network. The other thing that we just talked about is this, in, the shop promise. Now we can actually help uh, consumers make better decisions by implementing shop promise, which shows two day and one day delivery promises to merchants, online stores and across places like Facebook, Instagram and Google, which increases consumer trust and we think can actually, uh, really help our, our, our merchants. So the, you know, like all of our acquisitions, Acquisitions, culture fit, uh, product fit really matters more than anything else, but also their business model and the way they think about their capital expenditure and their operating expenditure uh, really resembles the way we think about things, which is really asset light. Thanks, Colin. Our next question comes from Gabriella Borges from Goldman Sachs. Gabriella, go ahead with your question, please. Good morning. Thank you. Either for Harley or for Amy, some of the key macro dynamics that you're talking about with merchant ads and e-commerce GMV, how would you describe trends in the month of April compared to March and relative to perhaps however you think about a normal baseline for seasonality? Yeah, so um, I'll take that one. Uh, so let me just kind of land on on Q2. So year over year, um, Q2 of, of 2021 still had stimulus in it, especially in the early part of the quarter, April in particular. So there's still a year over year um, headwind with respect to, to that uh, for April and, and Q2 of this year. Um, then we spoke about the shift in rebalancing and consumer spend to travel and services and in-person shopping. And we expect some of that to continue into Q2 uh, with that normalizing into the back half. That if you look at any uh, sort of mobility stats, it, it's now uh, getting closer to what would be deemed normal, uh, but there is still some rebalancing happening. Uh, and then the third factor that we talked about was inflationary pressure that uh, that we saw in, in Q1, which was not as big of a factor as the first two that I just talked about, but a factor. Uh, we're continuing to watch that one closely, um, and we expect that to ease as well into the back half of the year. Thanks for the call. Thanks, Gabriella. Our next question comes from Samad Samana at Jeffries. Samad, go ahead with your question, please. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, so I just, I want to think about the, the, the spending and the, in the OPEX plans. When I think about net ads being down, I know it's tough comps in, in the surge of new merchant, new merchant formation, but you know, the projections kind of have sales and marketing growth. Being pretty dramatic in 2022, and with net ads not expected to be kind of consistent with 2021, is it just getting more expensive to acquire customers? Is that sales and marketing expense more about a four different type of customer that you're going to, going to acquire? Can you just help us think about what this all means for for spend and unit economics uh, over the intermediate term? A, a couple of things in terms of um, you know I think in a, in a very difficult quarter in the markets generally. You know, we, we showed a profit on AOI, but more importantly, if you look over a two year period, uh, two year CAGR on rev, revenue was 60%, two year CAGR in GMV was like 57%. I think something that is getting missed here that is really, really important is that our value proposition, especially in an inflationary environment, is, is really unparalleled. Our merchant solutions revenue as a percentage of GMV was as high as it's ever been. That means that our immersive, more merchants are coming on, but also more importantly, our merchants usage of our product and solutions like capital payments, for example, are the highest they've ever been. And that means we're adding more value and solving more of their problems. So in terms of sales and marketing, we want to bring more merchants onto the platform. We're also getting more merchants from a lot uh, across the globe, not just in our core geographies, but internationally. And then once they come on, we really want to be well positioned to cross sell uh, all our different products and solve more of their needs. What tends to happen, the Shopify business model that really hasn't changed in a couple of years is that there are these different on ramps to the Shopify. People come to Shopify to solve a single problem. And then once they come in, they realize we can solve more of their problems. A great example of that, by the way, is, is the rebalancing back to 
to physical retail. We had all these, you know, all these merchants come on during the pandemic who were offline retailers needed to come online and we, and, and they, they came with us and they trusted us. And so now that their offline stores are reopening, their physical stores are reopening, they're now migrating over to our point of sale product. This idea of becoming the most important piece of software they use isn't necessarily just online or offline. It's all of those merchant solutions as well. So part of what we're, what we're trying to do right now is really become a well-oiled machine when it comes to making sure that every merchant that comes onto the platform takes more of our products and we, we solve more of their problems. That is really key here. And I think that's the reason why you're seeing these, these numbers. Great. Very helpful. I'm certain as you can shop five more on some of my favorite stores like Roan out there in the world. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks, Samad. Our next question comes from Josh Beck at KeyBank. Thank you for for taking the question. I wanted to go back to fulfillment. Certainly, it's um, really encouraging that you're planning on having, I believe, all of the SFN volume on your own WMS um, by, I believe, the end of Q2. I'm just curious when you step back and now factor in the contribution from deliverer, if the scale phase is still targeted for second half of 23 or 24, or if there's potential acceleration, just, just curious on that transition now that we certainly have, you know, a larger team and more capabilities in this area. Uh, and we did say that, uh, Deliver does accelerate uh, fulfillment volumes. Um, we, we gave you the number. There are currently over a million fulfillments per month and, and growing. So that certainly does give us uh, additional volume um, more quickly. Uh, the expectation is that scale will still be towards the back half of, of 2023 and into 2024. And We've always said that's where the unit economics really start to, to shift to favorable. Um, so we fully expect the volumes to continue to increase, in, you know, into that um, uh, that time frame. Thank you, Very Josh. Helpful. Thanks, Amy. Thanks. Our next question comes from Matthew Pha at um, uh, sorry, <laughs> Matt at, at William Blair. Matt, go ahead. Great. Thanks for taking my questions, guys. Wanted to just ask on the announcement of uh, Amazon extending uh, Prime to merchants' own sites. Does that have, you know, any impact on your business or maybe perhaps more specifically on, on how you're thinking about your fulfillment efforts? Thanks. Yeah. Um, um, so I, I think – the best way to think about this is, um, um, well, look, I, I, I know this is like people look at this and say, okay, well, what's Shopify thinking about this? And, and so, so I think it's probably worth spending a second, uh, talking about, uh, this because I think it's, um, more interesting than what people might imagine. Um, again, so Shopify's mission, um, uh, driven, what, what we really want to see is that the internet is this incredible entrepreneurial, um, canvas, um, for people, um, uh, we we want to see uh, you know people being able to reach for independence you know when uh, life's plan A doesn't work they can engage in entrepreneurship to see if there's something else in store for them quite literally um, so um, what we uh, get excited about is if infrastructure uh, is uh, shared with uh, small businesses because a lot of what happened um, in the sort of few decades of uh, you know since the 90s on the internet is um, um, that um, almost all the infrastructure that was built up, um, uh, digital and otherwise, really, really benefited to the, the already uh, already big. You know, like a huge factor. Like we 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 all know this here in the software as a service space. Um, the software as a service space was largely something that um, got delivered to enterprises. Um, uh, you know, the, even the way we sort of measured software as a service businesses initially. Um, kind of really didn't work for people looking at Shopify because Shopify was like extending very much to people, who, you know, sometimes um, almost consumer level, uh, you know, down in the market. We, we often are the first thing that people sign up um, and they incorporate um, and, and they only become a business shortly after. Um, so um, we are actually thrilled with uh, Amazon making a decision to take the amazing infrastructure they have built because they've 
I mean, second to none infrastructure and want to share this broadly with small merchants across the internet. And um, so we, we, are, we, are, we are happy to integrate this into Shopify uh, just in the same way how we integrate um, what the infrastructure that Meta built, the infrastructure that Google built, and the infrastructure that TikTok built and so on. Um, so this fits perfectly into, in, into our worldview. And um, um, it's not nearly as zero-sum as some people make, make, make it out to be. Whatever is good for merchants is, will cause more entrepreneurship, which is exactly helps the, the, the vision of a company. And from a business perspective, again, the, the more channel there exist um, that are va- valuable for selling, the more important the Shopify tools become because, uh, you know, managing this is, 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 some, is a task of significant complexity and uh, software integration can tame that complexity and create, um, you know, a cohesive view into the business and, again, make it much more possible for uh, small businesses to, 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 to engage in very complex retail strategies that pr- previously you would have to, um, you, you would need a lot of headcount for. So this is all, um, this is actually really good news, uh, from our perspective. Great. Thank you, Matthew. Our next question comes from Tyler Radke at City. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, so Amy, I wanted to ask you just, how we should think about the moving pieces in in the guidance and specifically kind of what has changed um, in terms of of your assumptions. So it looks like you're calling for uh, merchant uh, additions for the full year to be similar uh, to to last year. I think last quarter you'd expect it a bit higher. Um, And and so just help us understand, you know, how much you're kind of revising things down given the macro challenges that you you saw out there um, this quarter. Thank you. Yeah, so we've we've already talked a little bit about GMV. So just landing on the on the merchant ads for the year, we we did say we expect to add a number similar to 2021, um, based on what we saw in the first quarter. Um, I said in my opening remarks, um, we did see uh, lower merchant ads um, than than last year. And we largely attribute that to a very tight and transitional labor market, we could draw a correlation um, to our merchant ads to what was happening in the first quarter, not causation, but correlation. We expect that uh, labor market will start to ease. We're already starting to see news and information about that easing. Um, and in addition, we have sales and marketing and commercial initiatives, growth initiatives underway that are gaining traction that we expect will continue to gain momentum through the course of the year and have a greater impact on the back half of the year. So we're very confident about the continued opportunity of more merchants around the world. The international rest of the world outside of North America remains very robust territory for us. Um, and so we're, we're confident in that number. Um, obviously the other change that we made was, um, somewhat around, uh, adjusted, um, or I guess what we said we would, um, reinvest all of our gross profits back into the business, which we said last quarter. And then we added that deliver, uh, would be dilutive to our operating margin. And so what we mean by that, let me just give you a little bit of information so that you can size the deliver impact. Uh, we expect deliver to add a couple of points of growth to Shopify's top line in 2022, keeping in mind this represents approximately a half a year of ownership. Uh, we expect deliver to be slightly dilutive to Shopify's 2022 adjusted gross margin. Um, and about 80% of their OPEX is headcount driven, which is about 400 employees. So that gives you a really good idea of, of the size um, there. So with that information, you should be able to arrive at um, where we are on uh, our operating side. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Our next question comes from Paul Triver at RBC. 
Thanks very much. And good morning. Question for Toby. You know, there's various views out there on the the uh, proposed founder share. Could you pro- pro- provide your perspective on governance in general, uh, and then perhaps more directly, could you just put in your own words uh, to shareholders why you feel that shareholders should vote for the proposal? Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, well, look. So the. Um, uh, this is something the board of directors has been looking at uh, f- for a long time. We've obviously um, included uh, the B share structure in the IPO, um, and um, the board has seen this as a very, very positive thing um, for the company. It's you know like it's a founder led company, um, and um, it's a structure that uh, supports this kind of um, structure of a company very well. Um, and um, uh, you know the IPO that one. $1 billion valuation and it's uh, seen us to uh, well to this point. And, um, but to be perfectly honest, like we were in a bit of a rush when we decided to IPO back in, uh, back in the day. Um, and uh, we took a structure basically off the shelf without contextualizing it to what we really would like. Um, and so there were, there's, there's also some aspects that um, we'd rather like to change about it. Uh, so um this proposal is kind of designed um, to, uh, you know, uh, change some of those uh, governance uh, things. For instance, like it's going, it's taking the uh, B class, like it's replacing the B class with a founder share that uh, causes um, it to go from a majority uh, control to a minority control. It's uh, going to be capped at uh, 40. Um, it removes um, awkward things like intergenerational transfer um, from the, um, uh, you know, things that can be done with his shares. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, uh, shareholders can get some, um, uh, assurance that, uh, you know, this is really a structure supporting, um, the sort of founder ledness of a company by, uh, creating like a service based, uh, uh, requirement for, uh, my involvement. And, um, I think that, um, it, I mean, it's, a, it's a proposal designed to be accepted, obviously, like I, uh, um, it's, uh, at the, the day it will change from one to the other. It's, uh, you know, on all measures, it, things come, come down to lower percentages. Um, and the board thinks this is a better, uh, governance structure for, 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 for the future. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's why it's included. I'll just add something that I, I don't think Toby would say, but, but I certainly, uh, can say it based on my, my experience at Shopify and my experience working with Toby for well over a decade. I think that anyone that knows, uh, management knows Toby knows that this is a founder who not only cares deeply about building a hundred year company, it's also, you know, Toby has a proven track record and he can scale the business really well. He makes really good decisions in very complex, very fast moving spaces. And I think it's a combination of his technical knowledge, his vision, his domain expertise, and frankly, some very serious crystal ball skills. Uh, and on top of that, he's, he's a thoughtful leader and, and that leadership has delivered returns of over 60% per year compounded annually since our IPO. And so, um, that's something he won't say, but certainly something that I will say. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Our next question comes from Deepak Mathavanan at Wolf Research. Deepak, go ahead. Hey, guys. Um, thanks for uh, taking the questions. Amy, can you add a little bit more color on the retention trends uh, on uh, SMB merchant side? Are you seeing higher level of inactivity or merchant churn in the non-plus side of the business and uh, you know, uh, specifically on the e-commerce side, given that e-commerce trends are moderating and entrepreneurship activity may be kind of like a moderating, just want to hear a little bit more color on that. No, we really haven't seen any significant changes in, in the churn rates um, in any of the segments, um, plus or non-plus. Thanks, Deepak. Um, our next question comes from Siti Panagrahi at Mizuho. Siti, you can go ahead with your question. You'll have to go ahead and unmute. Go ahead, yeah. Siti, are you there? I see you, but it looks like you're still muted. Okay. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We hear you. Great. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you. 
Th thanks for taking my question. So wanted to understand a little bit about the offline commerce opportunity that you, you highlighted offline commerce. So is it mostly the customer who heard brick and mortar store, they move to online, they are going after the, your offline solution or do you see just uh, incremental merchants as well? So if so, what percentage of your merchants right now uh, have the brick and mortar store? Hey there, uh, I'll take that question. Look, I mentioned this earlier, but you know, we are seeing as retail and commerce rebalances with reopenings, we are seeing obviously more merchants interested in, in selling offline. A lot of those offline merchants that were, that were sort of single point offline merchants prior to the pandemic that came online during the pandemic, they are now coming to us and, and expanding their, uh, what they, what they take from Shopify beyond online to offline as well. And part of the reason that you're seeing Q1 point of sale GMV grow, grow by nearly 80%, which outpaces the broader uh, offline retail market uh, is because they're taking more of our solutions. The other part about it is because our, our point of sale and our pro, point of sale pro adopt, adoption continues to grow, we're also growing it well beyond North America in new geographies. We have new integrated hardware. We have new payment integrations. We are also seeing uh, balance come from new businesses to Shopify as well. And so I think what you will see, similar to some of our other products and other solutions like Shopify Plus, for example, is you will continue to see a healthy mix of people that are already on Shopify expanding and 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 taking more from us, but also people that are coming to Shopify to use our point of sale product. And that's the reason why we're making a lot of these key investments. And and you know, we've been working on point of sale for a long time. It's now in 11 countries. Uh, it now has, we think, the best hardware, the best software. And so we will continue to see people coming to Shopify for point of sale and then expanding into other of our solutions as well, uh, and that mix should continue. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Thanks. Our next question comes from Egal Arunian at Wedbush. Go ahead, Egal. Hey, uh, thanks. Good morning. Um, I want to go to uh, Harley's comments in the shifting uh, uh, digital ads landscape, and um, maybe if you could just paint uh, a little bit more of a picture of some of what you're seeing around the IDFA, the the challenges that Facebook is seeing, um, and then the, the stuff you pointed out uh, with Deloitte and Accenture and larger advertisers sounds like something that um, could potentially be powerful and promising if we could expand on that a little bit. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Yeah, the second part is yeah, is I'll answer uh, first because it's uh it, it's it's shorter. I mean, look, we've been <laughs> we have been stretching uh up market for quite some time. Shopify Plus came out, you know, I think 7 or 8 years ago at this point, and now we are seeing much bigger brands wanting to use Shopify, whether it's Audi or it's World Vision. Um some of those brands, some of those merchants, they want to come to Shopify in in a different way than maybe we're used to, which often is self-server with one of our agency partners. And so working with Deloitte, working with Accenture, who we've been talking to for some time and actually um, formalizing an agreement makes the onboarding from those very large brands through those large uh, consultancies to Shopify a lot easier. What we're also doing is building incredible trust with folks like Deloitte and Accenture so that they can sell more of Shopify, which, of course, we like. And, and the fact that their, their customers are asking for Shopify, I think, is a great endorsement. In terms of the uh, IDFA, uh, you know, I, we said this before. There is no discernible impact we've seen so far. We do believe these changes have created some friction for merchants in advertising and have lowered their return on ad spend. That is not necessarily a good thing, and it has disproportionate impact on, on SMBs. But that is why, it's precisely why we continue to connect with and even transact with buyers across many channels, whether it's social or it's search or it's email or it's shop. And those things make it a lot easier. Those also mitigate the risk of those type of advertising changes. So then when you look at what happened in the quarter just around shop uh, in terms of social commerce and you see that social commerce had, you know, it's, uh, it, it's gaining traction, uh, orders placed on those services more than quadrupled, uh, this quarter last year, we were really, uh, we think that's really exciting and, and more and more merchants are using things like Snap and Spotify and TikTok and native shopping on Facebook and Instagram and even Google through Shopify to reach most of the, more of those buyers and do it in a direct way. So um, we're excited by that. And again, you know, a 4X increase year over year, uh, I think speaks that there's that there's a real momentum in the social commerce space. Thanks, Thanks Sigal. Our next question, and it looks like it's going to be the last question we have time for, comes from Darren Aptahi at Roth Capital Partners. Darren, you can go ahead with your question. 
Hey guys, good morning. Um, can you just kind of speak to uh, relative growth of non-English speaking plus merchants versus those that are English speaking? Thanks. Yeah, and in terms of Shopify Plus, I said this in the prepared remarks, but I'll, I'll just repeat it. It was a very strong quarter for, for Shopify Plus. We had our strongest number of deals ever close in a single month. That's 20% more deals in March than any other month. And our share of Plus merchants outside of North America expanded. Um, so I think we'll continue to see that. We also see a mix of both strong upgrades as well as net new to Shopify. That'll continue as well. But Shopify Plus, you know, some of the names that I'm talking about, whether it's uh, Havana is in Mexico, one of the largest footwear brands on the planet, or it's companies like Fiera or it's, you know, um, TRX, we, we believe that Shopify is the best, Shopify Plus is the best product for growing brands that want to have modern commerce and modern retail. And so we'll continue to invest in that. We're also making a lot more, adding more uh, features, more functionality, things like Shopify Flow, for example. Um, and I think Shopify Plus is, is getting, is getting a lot of traction here, but it will not only be North America, it'll be global. Great. Thanks, Harley. Well, we are out of time. You know where to find us if you have any follow-up questions. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. This concludes this morning's call and webinar. Everyone can now disconnect.